The cosmic hunt is the name given to a variety of myths that can be found in many cultures, separated by vast geographic distances and belonging to wildly different time periods. Their similarity is astounding and has led a lot of researchers to suggest that an incredibly ancient myth was passed down over thousands of years, with its movements and changes reflecting that of migration patterns and cultural influences. However, figuring out exactly how this took place is not easy. So researchers have looked to the work of biologists for ideas on how to overcome this problem. Over the past decade or so, they have been using phylogenetic analysis to trace the evolution of myths, helping them to build family trees of sorts. In this video, I'm going to talk about this remarkable approach to the study of mythology. Most of what I'm discussing today comes from a Scientific American article written in 2016 by the anthropologist Julian Dewey, who has done a lot of research using this method. The diagrams used in that article come from an earlier scientific paper by Dewey, and they are extremely complicated and low resolution, so I can't replicate them here. However, I would suggest that you go to the link in my description, open the article and take a look at the diagrams, since they're really useful in understanding how this method works. Phylogenetic analysis is a world away from traditional comparative mythology, which has many limitations. Let's start with an example of what the cosmic hunt is. In classical Greece, the myth begins with Artemis, the goddess of the hunt, insisting that Callisto remains celibate. However, Callisto is seduced by Zeus, resulting in the birth of a son called Arcas. Zeus's jealous wife Hera then turns Callisto into a bear, causing her to live in exile in the mountains away from her child. When Arcas reaches adulthood, he becomes a hunter, comes across his mother in the form of a bear, and tries to throw a spear at her. Zeus then appears, rescues Callisto, and turns her into the constellation Ursa Major, what we call the Great Bear, then changes her son into Ursa Minor, what we refer to as the Little Bear. We also call the seven brightest stars of Ursa Major the Big Dipper. In the Western Siberian version of the myth, the bear was originally an elk who steals the sun before the sun is returned to the sky by hunters. Why must the cosmic hunt stories have a common origin? Could they not have just appeared in different cultures independently as a sort of inevitable archetype related to the human experience? Dewey argues that if this were the case, it would appear everywhere, but there are cultures where it does not feature at all. To test the relationship between different versions of the myth, Dewey compared 18 variants of the cosmic hunt in an evolutionary family tree by contrasting smaller elements of each story called mythemes. To do this, he built databases and used statistical algorithms to create his model. He found that the cosmic hunt arrived in the Americas via three different routes. These three branches showed a connection between the Greek and Algonquin myths, a route through the Bering Strait, and another route which originated in Asia before diverging into both Africa and the Americas. Dewey points out that in evolutionary biology, it has been found that species don't change that much over large spans of time, with changes tending to occur rapidly and rarely. This is called punctuated equilibrium. A similar pattern can be observed in the evolution of myths. According to Dewey, versions of myths change quickly as a result of cultural or environmental influences or migration bottlenecks. In fact, those stories that stay the same for thousands of years very much reflect migratory patterns. An example of this is the Pygmalion story. An example of this is the Pygmalion story, the most famous source of which is Ovid's Metamorphosis. In this tale, a sculptor in Cyprus, who is disappointed at the local women practicing prostitution, decides to live a life of celibacy and concentrate on his work. He starts to carve the sculpture of a woman that, according to later sources, he names Galatea, before dressing her in clothes and expensive jewellery. After a while, the sculptor falls in love with his ivory creation, his depiction of the ideal woman. Then, during the festival of Aphrodite, he makes an offering to the goddess and asks for her help in meeting a woman just like his sculpture. Aphrodite comes up with a better idea, bringing Galatea to life, 
who then goes on to marry Pygmalion and have his child. Dewey's phylogenetic analysis suggests that the Pygmalion myth evolved in Africa as humans migrated from the northeast of the continent to the south around 2,000 years ago. Tribes along that route tell variations of the myth, but instead of ivory, the woman is carved from wood. Dewey compared two versions of the myth, the Greek one and one told by the Bara people on Madagascar. In spite of the vast geographic distance between the two locations, both stories have the same structure, and these seem to have evolved from an original myth created by the Berber tribes in the Sahara between 4,000 and 3,000 years ago. Madagascar's isolation and ancient Greece's limited contact with African folk stories kept the two versions of the myth from deviating from one another. An additional example given by Dewey is the Polyphemus myth, which he analysed using 56 versions of the story, 190 myth themes and three databases. In this myth, the one-eyed giant Polyphemus kills and eats six of Odysseus's 12 men when they accidentally enter his cave on the island of Cyclops. Odysseus gets Polyphemus drunk and, when asked his name, says that it is nobody. Whilst the giant is sleeping, Odysseus blinds him, causing Polyphemus to scream for his fellow Cyclopses to help him. They ask who it is that blinded him, and he responds with, nobody. Odysseus and the remaining six men are then able to escape by holding on to the underbellies of Polyphemus's sheep. A comparable myth is that of the Blackfoot Indians, an Algonquin tribe in North America. In their story, a crow hides a herd of buffalo in a cave, which was an important food source for the tribe. The crow, a human-bird hybrid, is captured and agrees to free the buffalo, only to then break his promise. Two hunters transform into a puppy and a staff, which causes the crow's daughter to carry them back to the cave. Once inside, they transform into a large dog and a man, driving the buffalo from the cave. To have a successful escape themselves, they hide within the skin of the animals so as not to be seen. Dewey was able to trace two evolutions of this myth, which reflect ancient migratory routes. The first migration was from Europe to North America in the Paleolithic era, and the second migration was related to animal domestication during the Neolithic period. Dewey also suggests that a very ancient version of this myth in Switzerland has been preserved since the last glacial maximum more than 20,000 years ago. Researchers in comparative mythology have also noticed that rock art and cave paintings depict motifs that are found in the stories. It's possible that many myths have very ancient origins deep into the Paleolithic and were expressed via both art and oral traditions. Dewey has found that the evolution of myths mirrors the out of Africa hypothesis in which biologists suggest that humans moved out of Africa towards Asia, then Australia and North America between 70,000 and 50,000 years ago. It appears a second migration then took place from Eurasia to North America thousands of years later. I find the study quite remarkable. It supports the diffusion of ideas and culture, which makes a lot of sense to me. But what I can't understand is why in some fields of study this is acceptable, and in others it's not. For example, there's a lot of genetic and archaeological support for the idea that the agricultural revolution spread from east to west as a result of migration. There are also a lot of papers on the idea that megalithism spread from place to place in a similar way, although there are a lot of geographic and chronological anomalies with that. Case in point, the temple people in Malta appear to have had a pretty good grasp of building techniques overnight, even though there are no megalithic monuments at the Neolithic settlements in Sicily and southern Italy where they supposedly migrated from. However, there is a lot of research to back up diffusionist hypotheses on a number of ancient history topics. But when it comes to comparing symbolism between different ancient cultures or comparing Cyclopean walls in different parts of the world or comparing Cartrets in the Azores, Turkey and Malta or comparing flood myths, there is a reluctance to find a connection, which I find quite strange. What we have to remember is that people have moved, shared ideas and traded with one another for an extremely long time. So there's no reason to rule anything out. Although I do understand that sometimes it's extremely difficult to find the evidence needed to connect the dots. As you know from my Cyclopean War videos, if the Romans did learn how to build them from the semi-mythical Pelasgians, there's nothing in the archaeological, epigraphic or literary records that proves this. 
Personally, I think we've inherited a lot from our ancestors and that very ancient realities of the human condition can be teethed out via modern methods such as phylogenetic studies and linguistics. In the article, Dewey mentions that he was also in the process of expanding a super tree that included Paleolithic myths of, to quote, women as primordial guardians of sacred knowledge sanctuaries. Since the article was written in 2016, I imagine there's some really interesting information on that by now, so I will have a look. This subject is definitely interesting because from the Neolithic to the classical period, we have many examples of women guarding temples and acting as priestesses. In Malta, although many of them are technically androgynous in appearance, the corpulent statues probably do depict priestesses. Then there's the Oracle of Delphi in Greece, and the list is endless. So I do wonder what proto-myth that derives from. I did meet a researcher on Instagram some time ago, actually, who studies connections between these myths. I had asked him to come on my channel for an interview, but he was very busy. So I reached out to him again and see what the latest research is on this subject. Another point to make is the astronomical significance of myths such as the cosmic hunt. Due to precession of the equinoxes, the visible stars and constellations appear to change position over time. And so some of these myths could be very old if, for example, they discuss constellations in a way that implies they were lower in the horizon. There's some interesting blogs on this on the internet, but I couldn't find some well-written detailed papers or articles on the subject, so I didn't want to get into that here. You know I try to stay consistent with the type and quality of sources I use for my videos, but I will look into how you can age these myths based on their astronomical content. Anyway, that's it everyone. As usual, I hope you enjoyed this video and that you would join the conversation in the comments section. Thank you to my patrons and channel members. Megalith Hunter is building every week and I couldn't do it without you. Please hit the like button and I'll catch up with you next time.